done to bring me happy You've returned to the one and only Star Trek talk show on broadcast TV, but it's not just you and me. It's the trio of three on this Star Trek TV talk show called A Captain's Log. Now, undercover and understood clearly with her fortified knowledge defending Star Trek is my co-host, Lily Fox Lim. Lily, I'm so glad you're here on our view screen coming in from Mintaka 3 because I couldn't and wouldn't do this show without you. Front and center. Welcome, my friend. Oh, thanks, VK. I think we make a great duo here on TV. And Raj is, well, a small part of our family, too. Our much pook. Flying through the final frontiers of space at warp speed, we're covering the rare, sometimes one-of-a-kind interviews for Star Trek guests here on our show. Yes, indeed, Lily. We have a dandy of an interview this week. What if I were to tell you we have a very popular Lost in Space and Battlestar Galactica TV series actress who's also a stunt performer. Who would you say I'm talking about? Well, this is a Star Trek show. What is her connection to trekking through the stars as a star in Hollywood? As always, you're spot on, Lily. She is that trekking star indeed. The first Star Trek villain and stunt performer two times over. Now, how is that possible two times over, you may ask? I know Star Trek had two pilots, and the original series even aired The Man Trap as its first NBC broadcasted episode, even though it wasn't a pilot. You are exactly right. You never cease to amaze me, Lily. Like McCoy once said to Spock in Star Trek V, Sandra Lee Gimple is our upcoming guest here on A Captain's Log. She appeared in The Cage as the prominently featured first Star Trek villain ever as a Telosian next to the main Telosian Keeper. We also see her on screen practically throughout the whole episode in the cage. Then we know Sandra was the M113 salt vampire creature that almost sucked the salt and life out of Captain James T. Kirk in the man trap as the first villain there as well. She'll be our guest coming up. And after appearing in her first production in 1966, since the cage of 1964 was repurposed into the menagerie, it's amazing to hear that Sandy is still stunting and coordinating. Yes, Lily, we have lots to talk about with Sandy. And whoa, do we have a lot of Trek-worthy news to cover. A spectacular Gene Roddenberry archive video was just produced on the eve of William Shatner's 92nd birthday. Now, this was produced by Cloud Graphics Innovators, OTOY, along with Star Trek Picard's production designer, Dave Blass. This video titled, William Shatner Reflections on the End of an Era, holographically returns the iconic William Shatner to the bridge of the USS Enterprise from 1979's Star Trek The Motion Picture. The Star Trek legend William Shatner speaks fondly of playing James T. Kirk and his agreement with the decisions to kill off his captain character. Shatner goes into detail about what went into the choice of Kirk's final words, oh my, and Star Trek producer Rick Berman's decision to center the Star Trek film franchise on the cast of Star Trek The Next Generation. William Shatner's full video for the Roddenberry Archive is bound to be a must-see for Star Trek fans, judging from this clip, which uses the wonders of technology to bring Shatner back to the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. BK, Leonard Nimoy's Spock appears in William Shatner's Roddenberry Archives video as well. The incredible sight of a CGI-rendered Ambassador Spock brings the late Leonard Nimoy back to life. In the scene set on Viridian 3 after Captain Kirk's death in Star Trek Generations, Spock arrives at Kirk's rocky gravesite and picks up his best friend's Starfleet Delta pin, which was left behind as a marker by Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Patrick Stewart. The scene evokes what Shatner wrote in his novel, Star Trek The Return, which describes how Kirk was resurrected in a non-canonical series of stories that includes another Shatner pen book, Star Trek The Ashes of Eden. <laughs> I have that hardback book of Shatner's, yes. The new season two premiere of Star Trek Strange New Worlds has a teaser trailer out that whets our appetite for classic Star Trek on Paramount+. Plus. The season premiere of Star Trek Strange New Worlds begins June 15th with 10 brand new episodes. 
oh, it's going to be a glorious return of the Klingons and the Gorn in a forlorn attempt to escape complete and sheer tractastic galaxies of strange new worlds. <gasps> A captain's log will keep you up to date on all of Trek's finest, including one of the finest original series two-time villains in Sandra Lee Gimpel, our guest, coming up on the other side of this break. A captain's log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Brian and I are thrilled to be talking for the next half hour with Sandra Lee Gimpel, Star Trek's first villainous stuntwoman and actress. Sandra, welcome aboard. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be in with you guys. Now, Sandy, you were born in Los Angeles. Was anyone in your family involved in the film industry when you were growing up? And what inspired you to go into stunts? No, absolutely no one in my family was uh, in the movie industry. Um, my mom had given us dance lessons to keep us out of trouble, my sister and I. And um, she decided that she wanted me to, um, you know, go to school and be a teacher. And... This one thing I was not good at was school. And um, little did she know that the dancing would get me into the movie industry. And from that, I ended up doing background work, you know, um, making crosses and stuff like that, because the dancers were involved in those days in the same union that was Screen Actors Guild and Screen Actors Guild in those days. And um, central casting was doing all the casting for the background. And um, they called and said, would you be interested in standing in on Lost in Space when they light the lights and set the cameras? And one guy looked up at me and said, who at the time I didn't know his name, it was Paul Stater. <laughs> and he was the stunt coordinator and said, so would you like to do stunts? And I swear to you on a Bible, I said, what's a stunt? <laughs> and he explained it to me and I went, sure. <laughs> And I ended up doubling Billy Mummy for three years. Um, the little He was 11 years old. I stood in. I did um, all his stunt work and ended up doing voiceovers and playing monsters on the show. <laughs> What's a stunt? I love it. Thank you for sharing that amazing story about the start of your career. Yes, and we've heard Paul Stater spoken of in a positive light regarding stunt careers many times here on A Captain's Log. Now, Sandy, I heard a tidbit from a recent interview that Paul Stater asked you on an off day from Lost in Space to go play this Telosian on a pilot because uh, called Star Trek uh, because they wanted someone who wasn't allergic to latex. They wanted somebody that wasn't going to break out, you know, because so many people do, and it's you don't know until you put this stuff on. But I'd already done Monsters on Lost in Space. So it, none of that stuff bothered me. You know, and, you know, you're working more than a day. You're working a week. So it takes, you know, two and a half, three hours to put the makeup on in the morning. And then it takes another 45 minutes or so to get it off after you finish working. And that's, you know, that's constant on your on your face. And we did it for a whole week. Now, Sandy, did you have to audition at all for the role of the Telosian? Uh, we noticed in some behind-the-scenes footage, there's a dialogue coach off to the side reading your lines while you pump the head veins in a, a little prosthetic rigged up next to your hand. Can you tell us uh, how difficult was this and what was it like having to coincide with the talking of the lines? I, they wanted to make sure that I could, I knew how to, you know, make the the pumping look like the dialogue that was supposed to be coming out. So it just didn't go pump, 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 pump. It had to be the way we talked. So the dialogue people would, you know, we would go rehearse. So that's make sure that was done the correct, you know, we had the right timing. So this is why you're on set for a week long doing the cage pilot. You're doing all this coordination work ahead of time, including the makeup. Yeah, and I was if every time you see Meg, you gotta realize I was with her all the time. You were, yes. There was, there was a couple of other people that were Telosians also, but I was always right, almost always right behind her, walking through the hallways, doing when we were we weren't even doing much. You know, they would just they would show the cage and then they'd show us walking by. Yeah. So I was I'm always like on her right arm. You've gone on to work on many other science fiction movies and series over the years besides Star Trek, like Lost in Space. Is the science fiction genre one of your favorites? It probably is because it's the most fun. 
I mean, you get to play monsters, you get to do, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And um, it, it, it's the most fun. I, I've done a couple of things um, that are incredibly fun um, that it is funny because when you play monsters, there's always putting, you know, stuff, makeup on, special effects, makeup and all of that. You worked on Star Trek before the first episode aired. It was 1964, and the episode was called The Cage. What was your impression of the show when you were on set? And do you have any particular memories of being on the Star Trek set with Gene Roddenberry and Meg Wiley that you'd like to share? You know, it was very interesting when when you work like I do, you go in and do a job and you go home and, you know, or whatever, and go on to the next show and you don't think anything of it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I was doing, um, when I was doing Lost in Space, they had called from um, from Star Trek and asked, you know, if they had anybody they could wear the Telosian costumes. Sandy, you were on set as a Telosian in the cage. Can you go into detail about how wearing the latex Telosian head fit over you and the pump used to make the veins work while a dialogue coach read your lines? That sounds so cool. The Telosians was all, you know, headgear and makeup and they had veins running inside the, the headpiece. And then they had a tube running down your arm to a ball in your hand. And if you push the ball, it made the veins move. So it looked like you were talking tele telepathically. Oh, that's awesome. And I mean, today it's done, done so totally different. There's a special effects guy in the other end of the room making it happen. Um, and so, you know, that was a whole different deal, you know, and I'd have to listen to the offstage dialogue so that I could make the, the pulsing sound move like I was talking. And um, so we, we was, that was a lot of fun and it was different. That's fascinating. All the intricate details put into the latex and those big Telosian brain veins sticking out. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Sandra, back in the beginning of the iconic Star Trek franchise, you are the very first villain to ever appear on Star Trek on TV back in 1966 because The Man Trap is the first episode to air on NBC. You were the stunt performer who played Nancy Crater as the salt vampire M113 creature in the original Star Trek premiere. Amazingly, you were also the very recognizable face as the first villain in the unaired pilot as a young Telosian, most always by the side of Meg Wiley, who played the main Telosian keeper in that 1964 first pilot ever called The Cage. Now, there's some background characters in the original series as well. Tell us about your experience as an overall on the Star Trek series in both of these productions. When it got to being the salt vampire, they called me in and had a cast made of my head. And that's a plaster cast they make of your face. And then they make the costume based to match so it fits you perfectly. They put us in the, you know, they put me in the costume and sewed the head to the costume and it was all put together and brought me into the set to do the rehearsals with Shatner. Well, there were a couple of big problems. <laughs> One, I couldn't see. The eyes had little tiny slits. And so there were no, there was no peripheral vision whatsoever. The suckers on your fingers mm -hmm. were, if your fingers stopped here, the suckers were out here. Now you're reaching for somebody and you're missing his head. And he was laughing. He thought that was very funny <laughs> because I, I could never, I couldn't find him, you know, or I'd hit him past, past his head or slap him in the face. And so they finally said, I said, listen, guys, you're going to have to take this head off. I, you know, let me figure out where my marks are. That's the shot right here, right? If you can see that. Yeah. <laughs> you share that uh, picture with us. That, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I backed myself up and I, I walked up into where I needed to be. So I had the right arm length and we rehearsed it that way. And then they put the head back on and it worked perfectly. It was, you know, I knew exactly how far I had to go. It's the old dancer's trick, you know, how many steps do you need to get to where you're going? And so it, it worked really perfectly at that point. Um, the funny part was, which they do totally different today also, when they would switch me from the monster to what he thought he saw, his the ex-girlfriend, they would put a plate in front of the lens and they would draw either her or me, depending on which way we were switching, draw up in the, you know, the outline of the body, take her out or take me out, and then put the other one in 
in the same position, matching us up with the lines on the plate they put in, take the plate out, and then we would shoot it. Oh, that's fascinating how those visual effects offered support between the takes and that you remember all of those intricate details on the set of The Man Trap. Yeah, you can actually kind of see the jump a little bit when you watch the show, but today, you know, it's way different. <laughs> yes, I distinctly remember that it was Nancy Crater, the character. Now we're showing fans and looking at this salt vampire costume you're wearing. Is this the picture taken of you when you were doing the molding and the fitting at Paramount? But I go into the wardrobe and they, they take all the measurements and, you know, make sure that costume fit me and it was built for me. Now this might sound just a little bit goofy, Sandy, but Lily and I are huge Star Trek fans. Now we recognize your face, particularly your nose, the shape of your nose, now that we're interviewing here with the second Telosian character that you're playing. Fans, we're going to show you the picture on screen so you'll see what we're talking about. Amazing. Right. We do because you're wearing an enormous amount of makeup with this big Telosian brain on your head, but that is clearly you. You know, it's because it's funny. I look at it and go, I know that's me. Sandy, you're playing two back-to-back -back iconic Star Trek characters to star in the franchise for NBC. If you count the first pilot that was unsold to NBC, you're playing a villain as a Telosian. And then the first episode ever aired on Star Trek as the salt vampire. So that's incredible. Did you have any idea that Star Trek would become such a phenomenon at the time? And now with three generations of rabid fans like me and BK? I know now, but I didn't know then. You know, it's you, like I said, you just shoot and you go home. And I got to tell you, the funny part of all of it is Richard Arnold, who was Gene Roddenberry's assistant a few years ago. Well, he's not with us anymore, but a few years ago when he was, he called me and asked me to sign baseball trading cards of the Salt Vampire and the Toshin. And I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> so I called my agent and I said, will you do me a favor? Will you contact him and find out? I don't know who he is and he wants me to sign these things and he says he's going to pay me and I don't want, you know, I've never heard of anything like this. So she did, she made all the arrangements and um, I ended up signing the cards for him and we got to be really good friends. And then he called me and says, so would you like to do the 50th anniversary of Star Trek at the Las Vegas convention? And I went, Doing what? <laughs> Signing autographs and getting paid. I went, okay. I mean, it didn't even dawn on me. Yeah. So I did. And I was blown away. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how impressed I was. These people knew more about the Telosian and Salt Vampire than I ever thought I could know. And they were dressed in costumes and it was I, probably the best introduction I could have ever had because it was the 50th anniversary. And, um, and it was interesting because they're all asking me questions, you know, mm -hmm. of, which like same as you're asking me. And I kept saying, well, what do you do for a living? <laughs> and talk about crazy astronauts, doctors, um, and I mean, just they worked for NASA. They were they were the most intelligent people you've ever met in your life. <laughs> and I said, well, my God, how did you you know, get involved in that? And they go, Star Trek, because there was Dr. McCoy. So I wanted to be a doctor and they had they were inventing things. They were going to space. So I decided I want that's what I wanted to do. And the show influenced so many people in their lives, and their careers that it was incredible. It's those type of stories that make our hearts melt, you know, to hear the gratitude from the fans. We appreciate you all these years later and you feel it. And you're such a huge part of Star Trek's beginnings. That's awesome. Our co-writer and captain's voice actor was excited to see that you worked on the 1986 cult classic Population One, which was directed by one of his favorite obscure filmmakers, the late Dutchman Rene Dalder. Leck wants to know, what was it like to work with Renee? We were outside downtown Los Angeles, and supposedly there's no people around anymore. You know, it's all gone. And I ride a motorcycle up to a car, stop the motorcycle, look into the car like there's nobody there. 
and then drive off. And it's just setting up the fact that I think that there's just, you know, everybody's gone and the people are that are alive are not on on top of Earth. They're in, you know, in bunkers, whatever. And I almost didn't take the job because I don't like to ride motorcycles. <laughs> and I have a big problem. I'm only five feet, five one at the most. And if you give me any kind of bike over a 250, I can't reach the ground. <laughs> and so I told them that. And they said, oh, don't worry about it. It's not going to be a problem. We promise you we won't get you a big bike. We promise. And, okay, fine. Well, I get on the set. Guess what? It was a 350. Oh. <laughs> and it was tall. And I had boots on and I was dressed. And I couldn't, I, I got on the bike, I couldn't reach the, I barely, my toes touched the ground. So he, he was so sweet. He goes, you know, let's get the um, special effects guy over here, the prop guy over here, and let's see what we can do with the bike so you can ride it. And we literally tied the shocks down to get the bike low enough that I could put the ball of my foot on the ground when I stopped the bike. So I wouldn't tip it over. Oh, God. And, um, I mean, that's what I remember about this show. <laughs> now, Sandy, you're still working now into your, can I say your age? You know, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Into your 80s. What's the most dangerous stunt you've ever performed? I was doing Bring Them Back Alive with um, Bruce Boxleitner mm -hmm. TV series. And we were out at Indian Dunes shooting where the Twilight zone action ha uh, accident happened. Uh, they have a motorcycle 100 feet in the air hanging off the side of the cliff. And Bruce's stunt double is supposed to swing over. I'm supposed to be in the sidecar. Grab me. We swing back. The bike drops and explodes. I get there at 7 o'clock in the morning. You know, they go to hair and makeup and all of this. And they I come out on the set. And I came out on the set because I wanted to go check the rigging. I said, listen, can I go up and check the rigging now, please? Oh, no. You, we've got a professional mountain climber and he's all rigged and we're going to, we can't, we just don't have time. And I'm like, well, then I'm not getting on the rig because I want to see it. <laughs> well, if they probably could have fired me, they would have, but it was too late. So I called Gary um, Epper, who was doubling Bruce at the time. And we went up on the, it took about 20 minutes to get up around the other side of the mountain just to get up there. And, um, they had an eye hook in the ground, huge eye hook in the ground, with the motorcycle attached to it, our repelling line attached to it, and no backup ties on the repelling line. Oof. So there was a tree close enough that we had enough rope left on the repelling line. We tied it around for backup on the repelling line, at least. We came back down. I got on the rig. Gary got on the the um, repelling line. Now he swings over, grabs me. We swing back, and the bike drops and explodes. The only problem is we're supposed to swing back like this. We swung back like that. Oh, wow. We dropped probably a good ten feet, and we're holding on to the side of the mountain. <laughs> which is a joke because it's it's shale and it's coming off in our hands oh. and it's straight down 100 feet. Yeah. And I remember looking at down and yelling at the crew, get us down now. And all I could see, and it had to be split seconds, was the crew standing there with the mouth open, oh, wow. like in awe. Now, I'll bet this person knows how to do a rig. Sandra, you also work with Dennis Madalone many, many times on Star Trek The Next Generation and different Star Trek series, as well as other series on, I believe, the Universal lot outside of Star Trek. Can you tell us what the experience was like working with Dennis and tell us what you were doing? At Universal, I actually got Mrs. Columbo, Double D Kate Mulgrew, and stunt coordinating the show, which was um, breaking glass ceilings in its own roof. Oh, own right. But anyway, so I had doubled Kate a lot. And then Dennis got Star Trek. And I called him and said, and I had been working, we had been working on BJ and the Bear and all of these other shows at Universal, just, you know, working a lot together. And so I called him and said, you know, I doubled Kate on this show and I wanted to come double her on Star Trek. And he goes, you can't. And I go, what do you mean I can't? 
<laughs> and he goes, you're not tall enough. She's five four. And I went, but I just doubled her for a year on this show. <laughs> yeah, because we're in the car all the time driving, and this is not the car. So I ended up, I, I didn't get to do double her on the show. I got to work on the show as a um, a, a crew member falling down when the, sh- the ship would launch and lurch and do all kinds of crazy stuff, but never got to do much of uh, other than that on the show. But um, yeah, Dennis and I are really good friends today. I mean, we worked on um, Castle for a long, he coordinated Castle and I worked on, I did, I don't know how many episodes of that show. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Thank you for coming back aboard with us here on A Captain's Log. We're in the middle of a fascinating interview with Sandra Lee Gimpel. Okay, so we were talking about the fact that I keep doubling older ladies now because I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> and there, and the, the, the sad part is, is that there are no older stunt ladies working. The guys seem to, you know, I, I do coordinate and I direct second units, um, which means I'm directing the action units as the director. But... The guys really do advance that way, where it's very difficult for the girls to. And for some reason, the girls don't stay in the business that long. I guess maybe because they get married and they have kids and whatever. Their life goes maybe in a different direction. So there are not a lot of older stunt ladies in the business. And my daughter's going to kill me. But being 83 years old, <laughs> um, everybody keeps going, are you still working? And I go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm in knock on wood. I'm in pretty good shape. I um, work out, you know, three to five days a week. And um, I just finished shooting uh, about four days ago, uh, CSI Las Vegas. Nice. Where I, you talk about makeup, three hours of makeup, making me look about 100 years old. <laughs> <laughs> People have been asking me to write a book for like years and I keep going, eh, because it's a lot harder than you think. <laughs> but um, it's written. The editor is just making sure my spelling isn't off the charts and putting the pictures together with, you know, the stories that I talk about. I've changed the title a couple of times, um, but it's I Fall for the Stars. Sandra, it's been an incredible pleasure having you with us here on A Captain's Log. Uh, I thank you for having me. My gosh. <laughs> we'll see everyone next week and bye for now. Manifested yourself to a human.